I extend to you a very warm welcome, a very hearty welcome. It is indeed a privilege and pleasure to have <clears throat> Professor, also Dr. Balram Singh Ji, to do a presentation on Kriya Yoga. Uh, I have earlier shared with you in Dr. Balram's uh, brief bio. He has been an accomplished professor in chemistry at the University of Massachusetts at Dharma. Uh, at the outset, I should say, Dr. Balram Singh, I won't be able to introduce you fully. You have so many, you have done so much work and so many qualifications. So I'll be brief a little bit. Uh, Dr. Balram Ji has been teaching at the Institute of, no, he has been an accomplished professor in chemistry at the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. He has also been teaching at the Institute of Advanced Studies at Dartmouth. That institute is a leading institute for research, scholarship, and education in human health and self-reliance besides planetary sustainability. He is the president of that institute. Dr. Balramji has also been visiting professor at Georgetown University, Harvard Medical School, Yangming University in Taiwan, and Jawaharlal Nehru University in New York. Dr. Balramji is a founding director of Botulinum Research Center, the Center for Indic Studies, and the prime bio in uh, Bio Incorporated, a biotechnology company, all located uh, at Dharma. He is also connected with a few other institutions engaged in promoting science and education. <coughs> Dr. Balramji has been teaching yoga and Ayurvedic courses at JNU and Delhi University for the past two years. He has also been uh, teaching science of yoga course at the University of Massachusetts. Besides research in botulinum and tetanus neurotoxins, Dr. Balram's research has been in the fields of Ayurveda, yoga, mind and consciousness. He has published 14 books and nearly 400 articles, including articles related to India's philosophy and traditions. I must thank Dr. Anil Bhatte, formerly of the IIT Institute in Mumbai, and uh, for introducing Dr. Balram Singh to this group to talk on Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga is one of the most critical elements of Yoga Sutras. It's superbly articulated and narrated by Sage uh, Patanjali some 6,000 years ago. While we'll soon listen to Dr. Balram Ji in depth uh, on Kriya Yoga, by way of introduction, it may be worthwhile to briefly note the structure of Patanjali Yoga Sutra. 195 in total. You may be most of you may be aware of that. So Sri Patanjali has divided these sutras into four chapters: the Samadhi Pada, Sadhana Pada, Vibhuti Pada, and Kaivalya. Samadhi Pada, that chapter one, it begins with the statement Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha. This chapter explains what vrittis are, and uh, such as Avidya, Asmita. Raga, Vesha, Abhinivesha, <clears throat> and focuses on making mind clear of the vrittis as a starting point of yoga. The idea is mind should become like a mirror, free of vrittis. Complete stoppage of vrittis. That is, Chitta Vritti Nirada is a path to attain samadhi. Complete stoppage of thinking also helps to reach samadhi, leading to consciousness absolute. So long as I sense prevails with reference to the object that consens, consciousness absolute, it is sapradnyat samadhi. And when that I element is gone with reference to consciousness, it is asampradnyat samadhi. I, we, we, will, we don't have to go into details right now. Uh, uh, chapter 2, which is the subject of today's presentation, it talks about three niyamas. And the first five steps of Ashtanga Yoga, or Bahir, which is called Bahiranga Yoga, Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranam, and Pratyahara. The first, very first stotra of that chapter says, Tapas Swadhyaya Vishwara Pranidhanani Kriya, Kriya Yoga. Tapa, self-discipline, and fortitude. <clears throat> These are the three. No, then Swadhyaya and self-study. Uh, and devotion to Ishwara, that is, 
that is Ishwara Pranidhana, is the yoga of action, karma yoga. These three virtues help to reduce kleshas. So, tapa, swadhyaya, tapa, swadhyaya, and Ishwara Pranidhana. These are the three elements of Kriya Yoga, and Dr. Ram, uh, Balram Jindji will talk more about it. Chapter 3 deals with uh, the last three stages of Ashtanga Yoga, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. <coughs> together are known as Sayyama. And chapter 4 deals with Kaivalya Pada, which is called Kaivalya Pada. The highest, it, it deals with the highest objective of yoga, that uh, you know, gaining different types of uh, siddhis. This is perhaps the most uh, difficult chapter to understand and work. Maybe we uh, one may need a guru to guide and practice. The universe of spirituality group earlier had a presentation on Samadhi Pada. Dr. Balranji, as I said, will talk about Sadhana Pada or Kriya Yoga. We will arrange self-standing lectures on Vibhuti Pada and and Kaivalya Pada in due course. I think with this introduction, I, I request Dr. Balramji to take the floor and begin his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ramesh Despandeji and uh, Dr. Anil Bhatteji, who have been friends for a long time and discuss various things. This is a, I understand, is very august group of people who are very deeply interested and very knowledgeable and uh, my knowledge of yoga and uh, philosophy and other things are very perspective oriented i am basically a scientist i have happened to be in in this situation that uh, i i confronted some of the issues when i was uh, teaching at the university of massachusetts I originally come from my, my background should include I originally from, come from a village and so I have a perspective coming from India which is many times a little bit different than most others and so I think you can mute some of those people. Yeah. Who... Yeah, those, uh, can you all unmute please because you get disturbed. Yeah. Please unmute. You, you can mute yourself. I mean, the whosoever is the host can, can mute. So anyway, I, I was just saying that my, uh, my interactions and many times confrontations with uh, situations has forced me to think about some of these things. So as a scientist, I've been uh, looking at this. So my knowledge, even though you said that maybe I'm going to talk about um, the different chapters Samadhi Pad, Kaivalya Pad, and, um, and others. Uh, I'm not uh, going to really talking only about the text. I'm going to use those concepts. And that's how I, I taught and it's developed a course in science of Kriya Yoga. And, <coughs> and that's how I address it. So I hope it will make sense. I hope it will not disappoint you if you're looking for very textual concept. Uh, concept or consideration and discussion. I would be discussing the, the text, but it will be in some context. So I will be now sharing my slides and then um, feel free to ask questions or interrupt me. I don't mind it at all. Or I think what you have in your plan is that I will have about an hour to discuss and then you will have um, questions at the end. Is that the format? My understanding is correct? I take that as a yes. And uh, so I'm going to share my slides. And uh, the first slide, you know, if I hope it is visible to you. Uh, the first slide is just the title slide. There you go. So it's a Kriya Yoga. And um, I wouldn't go into history, but many of you probably know that this is, is uh, Babaji and Lahari Mahasa, Yukteswar Giri, and Paramhans Yoga and, and then many other followers of that have been promoting the, the concept of Kriya Yoga and there is a self-realization fellowship SRF in uh, California that is a uh, more formal place if you're really interested in. There are people in Florida, there are people in Chicago, there are people who do Kriya Yoga and, and practice. I, I happen to learn from somebody who came uh, to the in, university here and he had Kriya Yoga and I had not even heard about it before that. 
I didn't believe in yoga. I had no idea. And I actually was pretty much opposed to all that until 1999. So uh, I learned this and Kriya Yoga from uh, a person by the name of Yogi Satyam from Prayag. And so, and then I, uh, I got so inspired by practicing it that um, I believed and now I still believe and I practice it. And, and so I normally start uh, to be on the same, same page if you don't mind, uh, since you are all very sincere people, if you don't mind, I would say that we do one or two poses. If you can put your hand on back of your head and sit straight with your feet down if you are sitting on chair. And I would suggest that we feel the, our backbone. Backbone behind our neck, behind our chest, behind our stomach. behind our abdomen and the lowest part of our backbone. Those are the five areas. They happen to also match with the chakras. Muladhar, Swadhisthan, Maripur, Anahat, Visuddhi. So if you, if you feel the five areas of your backbone, just feel which one you are feeling the most of the five is the one behind your neck, the one behind your chest, the one behind your stomach, and the one behind your abdomen, or the lowest part of your backbone. And I would suggest slowly to bend your body to the left. Slowly bend your body to the left and monitor the changes in your perception of your backbone, those five areas, or five chakras. And now we are in the left bent position and then feel again, see which one we feel the most. The one behind our neck is called cervical, thoracic, the one behind chest, lumbar behind our stomach, sacral behind our abdomen and coccygeal at the end. We slowly bring our body back. As we bring our body back, we feel the changes in those five areas. Our body is upright. We'll take one more turn to the right. We bend our body to the right and feel changes in those five hmm? areas. Part of our body. Yeah. yeah. We've seen that. In in the chakra system? The uh, advertisement that. They are known as from the top, Visuddhi, yeah. Anahat, Manipur, Swadhisthan, and Muladhar, those five chakras. I never talked to that. Feel them, their intensity. Which one is the most? And the next most? and the next most, and the next most, and the last one. I'm doing a little fast here because we, I want to talk more about it. Let's bring our body back slowly again so that you can feel the five areas of your backbone and the changes that occur in them. They are in upright position. Feel the five areas again. I didn't see Pragananda Baba there. The one behind your neck or yeah. cervical. The one behind your chest or thoracic. The one behind your stomach or lumbar region. And the one behind your abdomen, yeah. sacral region. And the coccygeal region at the bottom. Now bring your hands down. And I, I begin, hopefully we have now been of the same mind of some kind looking at our own body. Uh, this is a picture of this same kind of practice that I used to ask students to do in the class. In the lower left corner, you can see actually I'm sitting in front of the class and practicing along with the students. 
well, it used to be very popular class. Uh, it will always used to overfill. And the students still remember and sometimes call me about this. Now, yoga is in general, um, we have Dr. Deshmukh in the audience, and he has, you know, I see his, his um, postings. He knows it very well. The yoga has been playing a role in many um, health related issues, particularly related to neuro system, immune system, metabolic system, and inflammatory system. And there are so many places where these things are giving positive results to people by doing yoga in general. Again, I would not go into detail just to give you an idea. Yoga is a very ancient knowledge. At least Bhagavan Buddha and today Dalai Lama, they all uh, have fo uh, followed yoga and then came out with different ideas how to express that. Whether it's the Eightfold Path or Four Noble Truths in Buddhism, Karma and Dharma, ideas. This is all supposed to have originated after practicing yoga, exercises, and contemplations. In, in uh, archaeological terms, yoga postures have been uh, dug out in, in different sites, and then they can see the yoga postures at least 5,000 years. Bhagwan Shiv is supposed to be uh, the ultimate yoga. Uh, yogi, and and he is always seen in his meditative posture, yogic posture. So this is a very ancient and very well recognized process practice that has happened that has been going on in India, probably everywhere else, but maybe not as much known. Uh, they may be doing in different names or calling it different traditions, but nevertheless, they, this kind of thing has been going on. Now, I want to bring it to the more scientific level as to where yoga fits in the knowledge system. There are two kinds of approaches to knowledge. One, I, this, I'm assuming this is being recorded. If not, then please, uh, you can turn on the recording. Um, so yoga is, there are two, uh, excuse me, the, the knowledge is in two forms. One is called deductive knowledge which is also known as top-down approach. You have an idea, have a theory, build some hypothesis, test it out, prove it, and that will be the knowledge. And there is the inductive knowledge, which is uh, you make observations first, uh, make uh, patterns of those observations, and then uh, try to ask some question out of that observation as to what that might be, and then you can create theory. This is related to Indian system. The reason I'm talking about is that there is a Nigam Shastra and there is an Agam Shastra. Nigam Shastra is more textual knowledge, um, Granthas, that includes Vedas, Bible, Quran, and they just tells you what to do. Uh, however they have been originated, that's not the point. But the point is that there is supposedly truth or theory and then people uh, just follow them and hopefully it turns out good for them. Yoga is on the opposite side. It is an Agam Shastra whereby you practice it. That's part of the reason why I suggested that we do something rather than I just give lectures uh, or I read the, the book, Patanjali Yoga Sutra and, uh, and then I talk about it. Uh, you, If you have a little bit of your experience, that's how I learned. I, like I said, I did not believe in yoga. And until I did it, when I did it, it made sense to me. And when it made sense to me, then I'm, I'm working on it. I do research, even make publications in this area and connect it to my science um, experiments and, and ideas. These two traditions are very different. Um, one is very natural, very practical, very connected. The other one is being told and you got to do. And I, I give this example which 
is connected to yoga in a certain, certain sense, but not directly. Um, is the how the nature uh, is seen in Agam Sastra and Nigam Sastra. Nigam Sastra is like we have week. So today happened to be Wednesday. You know, it, somebody could say tomorrow to be Wednesday and that will be tomorrow Wednesday. There, there is no real uh, physical, astronomical idea that today is Wednesday. If somebody just started somewhere, some king who said that, you know, in the Gregorian calendar or Julian calendar, they declared it to be like this. And they said they also the seven days is really because Bible says, equally here in Encyclopedia Britannica says, it is artificially devised. Whereas uh, the Sukla Paksha and Krishna Paksha that is in, in India, which has been waxing moon and waning moon uh, concept, where it is natural, anybody can see it. You know, there is no, we don't need somebody to tell you that today is this, it's just how it is, everybody has to agree. So this is a knowledge system that we have. Yoga is very important part of it. In India, uh, Agam and Nigam, and as is true everywhere else, um, it eventually follows these both. You know, there are revolutions even in religious terms, or sometimes there are scientific development and people are able to see both observations and using a hypothesis. Most of the time, uh, as eventually uh, in any society, it comes back to the interaction, the equilibrium between Agam and Nigam, and then, you know, they, they enrich each other. But uh, it, some, many times it is not without some confrontation and conflicts. Because sometimes people, especially when it comes from Nigam Sastra, they, everybody thinks that he got to do. And this is true, not only in Quran and Bible, it is true in Veda. I have talked to many people who, uh, who say Veda is a sruti and nothing can be changed. It is whatever it is, it is. And everybody has to accept it. So, we place yoga in that uh, position of knowledge system so that we know where we are when we are talking about yoga. This is very important because I not only this nigam system uh, is in, in religious traditions and philosophy, but it is also in science. This is an example where human beings like to dictate ideas on others. So this is a simple example of how humans traditionally have followed evolution because evolution is a very great concept nowadays in science. And so people have to make some scientific uh, notation to this. And one of them is that people thought that the people who are more evolved, those who have bigger brain. And so they organize different animals in the size, increasing size of their brain. As you can see, humans are not the top. They are second. So then they thought that, you know, uh, this is no good <laughs> because we are not on the top. So they, they said, well, you know, the, we need to do the brain weight divided by the body weight. And then they, they looked at the, that percentage and they found that actually humans are still not on the top. There is a, the, the animal called Shru, which is in India is more like a chachundar. So they, they were not happy. They, they came up with another idea called encephalization factor. This is all very scientific. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. And then this is brain weight divided by body weight to the power 0.69. And then here we are on the top. So this is, this is a more like a uh, deductive way because we have the idea and we think that you know, it has to fit like that. This is just to give an example how this Nigam Sastra can be dangerous. Dangerous in a sense like it is self-serving because we are human beings. We are the one making formulas that we made the formula that we are on the top. So that's why the people also come up with like this seven days, you know, which is related to how God created the world in, six days and took rest on the seventh day. This is not uh, a, something that is a uncommon in various parts of the world. There is a book written by uh, a, a well-known scientist, Heisenberg, who got a Nobel Prize for Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle. And his book, Physics and Philosophy, has a foreword by a professor from Yale University is a professor of philosophy and very interesting things I read in that. So I have noted a couple of them. So they say the 
elements of modern science derive from its theory and require a comprehension of that theory. So this is the Nigam Sastra I'm talking about. So, there is a, so even, even the modern science has this theory first. And so for correct use, this theory rests, rests on philosophical as well as physical assumptions. Now, I just gave you an example of, of the, uh, the evolution and brain size. And this brain is a physical size, the measuring it. So this is how they develop science today. And then when comprehended, these philosophical assumptions generate a personal and social mentality and behavior quite different from at points incompatible with the family, caste, tribally centered mentally, mentality of native Asians, Middle Eastern and African people. Of course, this is a European perspective. So they are saying that, you know, it, it, it creates conflicts because this is all coming from somebody else's lens and other people have different experience. And so this is a nigam idea. If you use nigam concept, even though science, we think we are doing great uh, research and, and discoveries and advancements, it is still has a perspective. It has a narrative. It has a framework in which everything is seen. I'm talking about all this in terms of Kriya Yoga. I will come to what we really uh, are interested in in, uh, uh, in the chapters of Patanjali Yoga Sutra. Uh, but I, I just wanted to position ourselves so that we know what we are looking at. Now, there are different concepts of religion, tradition, uh, I, a kind of a culture that, that people develop. And so if you look at that, religion is religion. Reunite. Legion means to unite, associate. And yoga is also to unite. So in a way, religion can be looked at from yoga perspective. And the tradition is habits of living. Culture is the community of traditions. Civilization is a reflection of that culture. And here I'm giving some idea because sometimes there is a conflict about yoga. There are some states, Alabama and, and Ohio, I believe, who's where yoga has been banned in the school by the courts because it has been defined as a religion. And I, if, if, um, I like to make the point that we all live in, I mean, not all of us, most of us here in the United States, also for those, those of you who are in India might like to think about this, that there is a difference between what is religion and what is dharma. And particularly religion needs to be explained in terms of yoga for, for yoga to become more acceptable. And I had done this in my class and I don't have time to talk about that, but I had very good positive results where the students felt like that they were really even strengthening their religion if they were a religious type. It seems, oh, it did work. My slides are not moving, so I'm, I'm going to reshare them because I think sometimes when you make some movements, <laughs> Uh, things stop. So I'm going to reshare my slides. Yeah. And uh, then go on to the discussion. So where I want to start talking about the yogas in some context. Like I said, I always like to talk in, in context. So here is life's holistic goals and means. People in general look for freedom independence, equality. India is having 75th year of its freedom or independence at this point, so being, being celebrated next month. So how does that have anything to do with yoga? And here is yoga is the way, which is where I want to introduce the concept of yoga. Now that we have some backgrounds about how the knowledge is created, how the cultures affect, how the religions are related. So here we have these three uh, very cardinal principles of life that people have, and then how the yoga fits in this. So, yoga is a practice to learn to learning. Astang yoga is yoga chitta vritti nirodha, which is the second uh, sutra of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra's first chapter. After Atha Yoga and Sasana, they say yoga chitta vritti nirodha. I will talk a little bit more about that later, but it's basically. In, in general, people think it is, all it means is that you need to still your mind. Chitta vritti uh, can be loosely connected to mind. Chitta vritti actually is a chitta, which is a consciousness, 
uh, it can, it, there are people who can see and, you know, like the doctor, um, this book is here and he, he, he keeps studying and working and writing and, and some forwarding uh, articles on consciousness. So the chitta is really consciousness. It's vritti is many fested in many ways. Mind is one of ways. And so people usually just translate that it is the stilling of the mind. You know, that means to, to stop or block or still or control. There are various words that can be used. Now, you can do only all this if you know who you are. So understanding of self. And that can be done only by Swadhyay. No doctor, no professor, no all politician can tell you who you are more than what you can tell yourself what you are, who you are. And that the second chapter's first sutra of Patanjali Yoga Sutra says, Tapa Swadhyay Iswar Pranidhanani Kriya Yoga. So this is where Kriya Yoga gets formally introduced into the system. Tapa, we know that we need to uh, do some penance. Various people call it various things, but I think it's some kind of a struggle you go through. And it is important that you do study yourself at that time. It's not like I do self-study of books. It is not a, uh, a self-study. It is a study of self. So Adhyay means study of self, not that you do your own study of books, which many times people misunderstand. And that has to be done in the context of some kind of a, 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 um, a broad base of all this, where it has, tapa has to be done because we are always doing some, some action, which is what is really Kriya, is called Kriya. As he has said here, that's Kriya Yoga. So you do some struggles and study yourself under this idea of Ishwar Pranidhanani, you know, devotion to Ishwara. And the Ishwara doesn't exactly mean God. There are some other um, more subtler ideas of that. And that's this whole process. The way it is done is Kriya Yoga. So when you do this in this way, you understand self. And so when you understand self, that means you understand your dharma, swadharma. And once you understand swadharma, you are independent. So if you don't understand dharma, your dharma, and if somebody else tells you, even you know, you can find a guru, but if there is a true guru, he will empower, empower you to learn yourself. And in Bhagavad Gita, it says, Swadharma Nidharam Sreyas Par Dharma Bhayava. You know, if you, with your own dharma, even Nidhanam means, you know, if, if you die, you, you, your end, that is greater because you will be more satisfied with that than if you follow somebody else's ideas, which is what happens most of the time in the world today. So you need to have understanding of Swadharma. And then when you, whatever you will do, karma, that will give you the freedom. Because you are not then attached, you are doing what you are. And the, what you are has to be understood with you doing this tapa swadhyay isur pranidhanani with the understanding the yoga is chitta vritti nirodha. Chitta vritti nirodha is, is a, is a I define it a little bit differently. Nirodha, many times people think it's stilling or stopping or controlling. But actually, in, in terms of physics, it's rodha. Rodha means resistance. Nirodha means no resistance. Now, it, normally, if there is no resistance, you have, you're just flowing. I mean, the car moves only because there is a resistance. So, when you're trying to move, there is a resistance. But when you're not moving at all, if you're trying to move in, in a slippery road, it, you have no control. Where will it go? But if you're not moving at all, it doesn't matter. So there is no resistance at all left. And that's what Nirodha is. Nirodha, which means there is no movement. There is nothing is going anywhere. And then you are established in, your, in yourself. When you establish in yourself, it's called Swastha to be in yourself. Swastha. And that's health. When you are, everybody is healthy. That's equality. Because you are equally in yourself. I'm equally in myself. And then we are all equal. 
Otherwise, I say, I want to be like you. I have to be given the same thing that you have, and you have to be given um, what somebody else has. It is just only conflicts. It's never going to be there. So it, this uh, yoga is a means to run your life peacefully with full satisfaction, or you may call, call it in ananda. It definitely in a very healthy way. So this has a um, solution to the, 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 the entire humanity or the entire universe of this creating its own order in this way. And I say this, um, I, I take sometimes issues with some of this and I, I, I'm, I afraid, I'm afraid that I define you know, some of these things like Ishwara a little bit differently and some people get upset. So I always invoke this um, government of India uh, constitution has Article 51A. It says fundamental duties. It shall be the duty of every citizen of India to develop the scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. So you can question everything in a very scientific way. By the way, this is the only constitution in, in, on, in, on this earth that I know has this kind of clause where there is a scientific temper is an important that speaks that speaks of India's tradition that they have always have had this questions and questions and questions the idea concepts of neti 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 naiti naiti comes by asking questions and inquiring and exploring and uh, and then finding out and then making conclusion and moving on so that's the concept yoga is in that sense, a very, it gives uh, a, a, a tool to look at things objectively. And objectively, the, 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 uh, mm, the, the goal of objectivity is being unbiased. So science has definition, some basic definition like a systematic study. Newton gave the idea of non-falsifiable. Now it is a considered objective science, but objective science can be very biased also. So to become unbiased or detached, you need to use yoga as a fundamental training to advance science. Or at least you can look at yoga from perspective of science like I'm trying to talk about here. So now I uh, want to talk about this uh, yoga calms the mind like yoga chitta nirodha I just talked. It has as much sophistication, even though it's only uh, Dr. Ramesh Despande mentioned that only uh, it has 195 sutras, but these are sutras. It's very important that these are sutras, just like we have E is equal to MC square is a sutra. It, it can be applied to many, many things. Uh, or force is equal to mass times acceleration that Newton's second law. It can be applied to gun, it can be applied to car, it can be applied to fruits, all kinds of things. So the sutras are very important to understand that they are sutras and they can be applicable in many, many ways if you have a good understanding of it. So uh, first of all, they have come up with uh, a, strong, um, a strong yoga or parts, which is yam, niyam, asan, pranayam, pratyahar, dharana, dhyan, samadhi. These are the ast, anga. And ang means they like they are all connected. They are not separate. They they do not need to be considered somehow separate. Although some people do only asana, some people do pranayam, some people do dhyan meditation. This is very common. Uh, but uh, but it is important to see that this is all part of it. So if you get hold of Balram Singh's hand, that means you got hold of Balram Singh's head also. Now. Dr. Ramesh Deshpande had indicated that I will be talking about various aspects of uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutras. So I'm going to talk about some, not, um, not that much detail. So here is the whole list. Uh, eight limbs of Astang Yoga that has Yama, Niyama, Asan, Pranayam, Pratyahar, Dharana, Dhyan, Samadhi. Just like in Pat the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, chapter 2, um, slope 29. But then each 
Yama and Niyama are very important. These are conceptual things. These are at a mental level you need to think about them. And they need to understand uh, a proper value of them, proper meaning of them. So Yama is codes of restraint, abstinences, self-regulations. That's what Yama means. If you go into Sanskrit, Ya, the, the Akshar Ya, I mean, I don't know in Marathi. Many times I'm very fond of Marathi, actually. I don't know uh, to speak Marathi, but I understand most of it. And especially when I look for some meanings of Sanskrit words, I find Marathi has a better, uh, uh, Marathi dictionaries give better ideas. So I'm, I'm very, very fond of that. Marathi people might know, uh, some of you uh, who speak Marathi might know this. But yama means, ya means the expansion, ma means stopping. So something that is naturally expanding, which you stop it, that basically means creating a restraint. And then it has ahimsa, satya, aste, brahmachari, aparigraha. And most of you know the meaning. And so I, since I want to talk about a little bit more than just talking about only this, so I will move uh, forward without going into each one of them, but I want to talk about a couple of them. Ahimsa is very important to understand what is Ahimsa. Many times people think Ahimsa means like, you know, Mahatma Gandhi is always told that, you know, because of him, Ahimsa, we have been in big trouble. <laughs> actually, Ahimsa does not mean what people understand. Gandhi himself did not mean that. Gandhi actually said he, th he thought that killing is also Ahimsa. He has written this. He has, there is a statement by Mahatma Gandhi, killing is also Ahimsa. And uh, this, if you look at Ahimsa, uh, Pratisthayam, Pratisthayam, Tat Vairya Tyaga. Vairya means enmity. If you don't have, if you, whatever you do, as long as it's not because of enmity, not because of Vairya, that's Ahimsa. In that it means of also killing. Vairya means that you have some idea, you have uh, some male design, male thoughts, malice. So you do not want to have malice. Then if you have to kill somebody, because somebody is doing something that is adharm or violating, it's actually it's not as much violence as it is violation. It's, uh, it cannot, it, you cannot do violation of certain things. And so like ahimsa parmo dharma, Dharm, it is the greatest dharma. His ahimsa means dharma cannot be violated. So is a, what that is what ahimsa is. So it has to be taken in that sense rather than just simply. Uh, I mean, literal meaning of violence is also true because most of the time people who create violence, first of all, they are unhappy and they are very very uh, angry, and that's not what you want to have. The same way about satya is also a very interesting thing. Is satya pratisthayam kriya Fala um, asraya, uh, asrayatam, asrayatam, asrayatam. Uh, basically, it means the kriya is another very interesting thing here. The kriya has kriya is something that is automatic. Uh, you need to make sense of it. It's kriya is a, you can imagine this is a, the, some kind of a formula. And here we are talking about not karma fala, balki, but kriya fala. And so it says that it, it, satya is established when kriya fal is the asray. So whatever is is uh, going to you are going to do what is happening, it will have its consequences. So it will be only kriya based on kriya fal uh, the, 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 the 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 deciding determining factor is going to be kriya, not what I want, what you want. And and I have. Uh, develop some good ideas about karma phala, which is different from kriya phala. Kriya phala is, is unpreventable. Karma phala is. You, you don't do karma, you, you, you don't get any phala. But because there is a, there is a karma phala has a, is a, it has a target. You want certain things. Kriya phala is something that is, you're going to, is happening and you're just going to observe it. Same way, uh, in the niyama, the niyama, no, niyama, niyama is another very interesting concept. Here, um, one has to see the excuse me. The 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 kriya fa, no, sorry the niyama is is derived from yama. Yama is already be talking about. I said that you know is expansion of certain things without if you don't stop them, 
And then all of them are ahimsa, satya, I stay, all these things. Uh, in, in more detail, if we talk, then you will understand that how it is restrained. Everything has to be restrained. Like not knowing the truth. The not, fall, not knowing the truth means not seeing that Kriya is going to have the Phala. It's only going to depend on the uh, Phala is going to be depending on what the Kriya is. You can't really do anything. So trying to not accept that is a lie. So it, you are not supposed to not accept. You are supposed to accept whatever that is. That's how Satya is. The uh, Ahimsa is already told. And Aparigraha or Brahmacharya, Astre, they are all trying to restrain certain things that is otherwise they are, they are happening. And you have a tendency to, uh, to get that, carried away with that, and you are supposed to uh, get out of it. Now, Niyama is not not doing that. It's a double negative here. The, the yama is a negative and niyama is not doing that. Now in science, what we do, those of you who have experimental science background, you may find that uh, we normally run controls. Uh, we run control experiments. So when we, we are, I'm, I'm looking at the effect of certain proteins, I, I uh, Dr. Uh, this Pandey was explain, uh, introducing me that I do research in, in different proteins and other things, and I do drug discovery research also. So if we want to look at that, then we have to make sure that we run a control. So if I want to see the effect of certain things, then I have to run about everything that has everything except that thing. So I have to get make sure that I have a negative control to so that that does not happen if this is not there. So in, the, in this case is that when you have uh, gotten rid of the things that you are not supposed to do, for example, you are not supposed to uh, do uh, hinsa, you are not supposed to lie, you are not supposed to um, steal, you are not supposed to uh, waste your energy, creative energy by focusing on certain things too much, or you are not uh, hoarding things. When you are not doing all that, then whatever else you are doing will be positive or will be helpful to you to understand. Positive here means will be helpful. So niyamas are, there because if you, if you are somehow you are angry, you are upset about some certain thing, you have enmity or malice, there is no way your mind is going to be clean. So then it is important to have clean mind. Manasa bacha karmana. You should have uh, cl uh, cleanliness. cleanliness. The same way you will not be satisfied if you, if you have envy to somebody. You are know, always looking for something. So but here, idea that I'm, I want to emphasize is that niyama is coming is a dull, double negative, which means once you got rid of the yamas, then whatever is left is how you then look at the world. And then it has swadhyay also here, also it has tapa also, it has yusur parinana also, it, it has. So from there, you can approach, this is the mindset one needs to create. This is the mental conditioning one has to get to with full understanding. Then when you're looking at asana, because this is the mental thing, the next two things are physical things. Asana is next, the physical. So you do different poses, different postures. What do we gain? It be, we learn to physically unite our body and mind. Because there is the only purpose in this is that you learn how to unite things. Since we have a body and we are identified and recognized for having the body, then we have to uh, use that uh, situation to put ourselves into this learning of how to unite things, at least within self. So then we, are, we do different postures and like I try to, you know, get, give you a posture and told you to pay attention to your five areas of your, your backbone, which is related to a spinal cord, which is, you know, uh, people like Dr. Desmukh knows exactly, <laughs> he's a neurologist, you know, where different areas of your spinal cord and what kind of uh, forces uh, or, or processes are involved in those, uh, those different kind of nerves. So I, that is the way of uh, us learning, just like we learn in, in middle school or primary school mathematics, the same way is true. This is very preliminary thing to know. So we know from asanas about our sensory organs and our body and how to deal with them, how to hopefully eventually understand them. And then pranayama is a subtle form of exercise. 
pranayam is the the asanas uh, get your nervous system activated so and nerves are not in every cell they are in tissues but uh, the the nerves are not in every cell but when you do pranayam pranayam has the air that goes and it goes to your every cell of our body and i have not experienced that but i am told that those people who are expert in pranayam they can uh, uh, they can focus their energy prana shakti in different parts of your, their body because they have to be uh, i see dr machwe saying that he has experienced that which is nice so pranayam is a very subtle way of getting to know ourselves physically something that is otherwise you are not knowing but only by can you can know by air because oxygen goes in every every cell has about 1000 mitochondria and every mitochondria uses oxygen so you are really getting into your subtle part of your this gross body but in a very subtle way so those are the two ways to get to activate everything that you have every faculty of your body and mind is activated completely activated and if you do practice those who do practice it not only is good for their health and other thing but really really they get to know themselves physically so then what happens is very interesting pratyahar says that now that you have learned everything about yourself and you perfectly know about your body now you give that up it's just like you earn a lot of billions of dollars and then give up every one or every penny of that that's called real danam you know you are you are in a danam danam bhav only if you have money if you don't have money you say yeah, i don't have any money i'm i'm biggest uh, dani but that's not uh, what dani is dani is like when you have earned so much and then you give it up so the same thing is true here that you have learned so much and then you say now all that knowledge i am now one by one i am giving that prat- pratyahar and then only you think about dharana then 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 only your dharana is not something that you say well, i am going to do like this no your chit becomes activated the chitta level when it sankalpa comes the is automatic and then it, your dhyan starts happening so the dharana is starts focusing on certain areas certain aspects and you can do that because now you're not distracted any at all by your, all your um all your um, sensory perceptions of yourself because you have already given that up so if you go beyond sensory that when the chit or in sankhya philosophy like you have ahankara or existence you get to your own existence you get to learn to yourself and when you learn that what you are then you find out my understanding is i have not really gotten there my understanding then you find out that you are all and that's where samadhi is so that that's the the concept so you we, we need to uh, understand what swa, what we for swadhyay what we do ist devta sam prayoga ist devta means you know the whatever your highest uh, um, highest goal of perfection ideal might be which let's say you are you want to get to the level of ishwara then you need to at least start with some ist devata whatever your nature might be interest might be and then some prayoga means completely become communion with that in in physics and chemistry it is called resonance you create a resonance you 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 exist but you resonate with others and that's the perfect communion or uh, when you are when you are in communion with anybody i mean in 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 christianity they call communion with with the god the, they also had the same similar idea but here is the methodology given without in, invoking god at all actually ishwara in here is very in, in on on uh, in chapter 1 verse 29 i believe or 24 one of them i can remember exactly it says klesa uh, karma vipakasaya apara mrishta purush visesha ishwara kles and karma vipakas means karma phal the person who apara mrishta means who becomes uh, beyond all that is not attached to that anybody who is detached or beyond kles kles means rag and dwesh and um, karma phala means pa- paap and punni 
I think an example, Papa and Punya. So when you get beyond this, then that you get to this state of mind as a Purush. And that's what Isura is. It's, Isura is not somebody sitting somewhere in heaven and, and or Baikuntha. And, you know, those are models. They are the concepts to understand. There is nothing wrong with that. But the, in, from yogic perspective, Isura is something that can be attained. We can attain to that label. And so that when you, you, you get to that label by uh, understand, doing swadhyaya, because you, this is in you. It's not something that you have to get from, uh, from outside. I already kind of gave this idea of uh, what science is. The last part is very important. That is subjective. Uh, you can be objective. I, I do research and I, I consult many companies and you know, get contracts and work for them. And many times they are, I, we do objective science, but they are biased. They're looking for only certain kind of things because that is what is going to give them either money or approval. So they, they can be very objective, but very biased also. But the yoga teaches that you can be completely subjective, but unbiased. So, and subjectivity is very important because yet pinde tat brahmande. So whatever is in you is what is the rest of the world. So you can be very subjective, but you can be detached to, to, to see the world. And this is something that can be happening only in terms of yoga. I was telling about this exercise that we did. In ex this exercise, we, uh, I, I uh, talked about you know, how the uh, cervical and thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal. It's interestingly, I have a very thick book of neuroscience. It says that these things were arbitrarily named like this arbitrarily. Now, it just so happened to be this arbitrarily also matches the chakra system. So it is quite possible that this knowledge of, uh, and, and Dr. Desmukh will be a good person to comment on this, um, but I, I, I read in a, 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 neuro, a neuroscience book that I use uh, teaching in my, one of my other course called Chemistry of Mind, and there I found that it was a so, so um, uh, surprised that they had uh, like this, just like they were talking about their things that are artificially created. So uh, the same thing, there is a, a great concept about, there is the physics of speech, you know, how, what we speak, how we speak, how we chant, all that has an effect on many aspects, especially in the, in the, uh, in the mouth is fully uh, innervated uh, area. And how you speak, what you speak has an effect on those and the many glands get affected and, and there is biological uh, things that happen. Uh, in that there is a biology uh, of the, uh, uh, that goes around what you see and how you say. And uh, so, so it, it's a, the language is very important. And we are talking about Marathi, Sanskrit, or other Hindi and other things, and uh, or different other languages in the world. And, uh, and they, they are all affected by this, uh, the kind of micro pressure that is cre created in the oral cavity. And that, that has an effect. And, uh, so this, this uh, uh, the nerves that they come from the brain and innervate various areas of the brain. Some studies have been done where, for example, they say the effect of sound is, a, uh, is upon each atom of the body for each atom resounds all, on all glands and on the circulation of the blood and on the pulsation of sound has the, its effect. Uh, also yogic mantras stimulate the secretions of pituitary gland which is located only millimeters from the palate. These secretions strengthen our immune and neurological sense systems. Anyway, the point I'm trying to say that this is uh, all uh, very much science, science oriented. You can examine some of this from science perspective. It's very interesting that uh, even chemistry was, um, chemistry periodic table was created or at least it got inspiration from Panchakshari of, uh, of Sanskrit language. And Mendeleev actually named some of the initial compounds with Sanskrit names because he was so affected. And you know, this is uh, a professor in Stanford has written the history about this whole thing, and it, it makes sense. And how how did this the the language in India? Um, all the languages have almost similar rules and similar uh, the grammar and similar similar pronunciation. Some have less, some have more. Uh, Marathi is one of those which is very close to Sanskrit. And uh, this uh, has helped the simple uh, arrangement of the, the letters, alphabets, has an effect on, because it, it has the incremental, it has from guttural to, to palatial to ret, uh, what they call it, retrodental, and then they call labial. 
So this is very systematically created. So what I, all it, I'm trying to say is that first of all, it has an effect. Secondly, people who created, they had good knowledge and yoga was part of it. Now, what, one thing I wanted to say about how we self-realize, what is the re self-realization here it means? Um, Dr. Despande, I, my time is here is only 9.33. I think we started about uh, 10 minutes after. Yeah, no. yeah, please go ahead. I think this is very, very useful. Very good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah I will stop. It's not, I mean, I, I, I kind of uh, have given the, the concept that I wanted and now it's only application of all this. So <clears throat> ultimately what is realization? Uh, there is one concept is yoga is like, I like I said, you are the Yushwara. You, know, you can reach the label, you can reach the state of Ishwara. Whereas the other Nigam Sastra says that God is there who told certain things to certain people with commandments and everything and they have to do. And the morality, immorality, uh, good thing or bad thing, uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, ethics that you have or non-ethics you have, all these kind of things that has come from the top. And I, it doesn't mean it's bad. It just I'm just saying that's the method it has been used. Now, in America, they did this experiment. In 2009, there's a proceeding to National Academy of Science. Uh, Dr. Modi is here. I'm sure he's very familiar with that. Uh, with very well prestigious journal. They did this uh, research on finding <laughs> their idea of God, whether it's, they say that it's egocentric. Uh, about people's belief. What they really did in this experiment is that they came up with 10 moral issues and it's like a euthanasia, abortion, um, that kind of things. Um, and um, they asked people this question, but they didn't ask them to answer. They put electrodes in their head. And then if the electrodes two places lights up, that means they think there is a difference. If, uh, if they it, 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 it does it lights up in one place or none that means there's no difference so here is the here is the, their experiment they asked on these moral issues what do they do they think that, uh, one what what when that person thinks versus what they think that a typical American has a uh, idea concept of morality on those ethical issues and they found that there is different they think that they have difference from a typical American. When they said what God thinks about those moral issues and what a typical American thinks, they found actually a, a, a more signal, which means probably a stronger difference. But when they asked him them what that person thinks about those moral issues and what God thinks, there was no difference. It basically means that God is a creation of a man because that, that man thinks that uh, what I think, even though what I think is not what everybody else thinks, but what I think is what really God thinks. And this is the concept that in India had been there for a very, very long time called Aham Brahmasmi. In physics today, people say that the, the, your world is your own projection. It is, it is the, your world may be very different than my world, my world, although we kind of agree this is the same world. If so physics and neuroscience and Indian philosophy kind of uh, agree with this. And so what I'm trying to say when you say, when I say that you are Ishwara, it basically the same concept if you ask people without religion, bringing the religion into it, just neuroscience and their own response on moral issues, they find they also feel the same way, that they are the one who really have no difference with the, with the God. And the, and the only thing is that Indian concept, yogic concept is something that you can elevate yourself to that level. So, and this is an, a, a concept from Upanishads where Atman and Brahman are the same. And this is actually, I took it from another um, uh, physics Nobel Prize winner who who had who has written a book called What is Life and in that he has really done quite a bit of um, this kind of uh, analysis of Indian Vedic uh, system and and physics and uh, so how does this all then work you know this all yoga kriya yoga and asanas pranayam how does this work and where it fits into this universe. And like I said, you know, if um, uh, you have until 10, uh, 10 o'clock, so I mean, maybe I'll take another five minutes and then I then we can open the question. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just only finish this concept and then, then we will uh, finish. Okay. So this, the, when I, I asked you to do this, um, this exercise with me to 
I didn't, I actually even told you that there's, those are the chakras, the five chakras. I didn't talk about the other two, the Agya chakra and Sahasras. So it is, it is an activation of those. And this is the activation of these chakras. It's like a, they are like a channel, you know, that the energy flow becomes very clear. And so the knowledge becomes very clear. And that has a very big connection philosophically. These chakras are the, the junction points of these five types of bodies that we exist in, physical, ethereal, astral, mental, and spiritual body. So physical body, whatever we did this, all this exercise, it gets into our, connected to our spiritual body. It becomes part of your spiritual, um, uh, uh, spiritual wealth, so to speak, because the whatever we do, it, they, they, at the junction of those chakras, these bodies have, have a knot where everything from a spiritual body comes to your physical body, everything from your from physical body or ethereal body or astral body or mental body, they all get exchanged and get all encrypted. And so that's how these things are very important, the whole concept of karma, because when whatever you do, it gets encrypted in your other bodies, subtle bodies. Now, physical and ethereal bodies die. Astral, mental, and spiritual bodies don't die. They, they live forever. It just is a state of body. I mean, uh, I, the way I look at it, it's just some kind of state of energy in which all the things, just like in computer things, are encrypted. And so when you get reborn, it's like a USB port gets connected again to you. And then now you have to deal with all the things that you have done. So what I'm saying this yoga is not only this concept that is only related to health or um, knowledge, but it is the one which runs our life, be it whether we know it or we don't. Some of us have better ideas than we know it. Others continue to, you know, getting hit here and there and eventually uh, figure it out, you know, by, by suffering in the, in the, in the world. There's a, what if we call it suffering. Um, in from from uh, Indian Vedantic point of view, there is no suffering. Everything is an experience, and so it, this the yoga has connection to this body system, and then this is how the people evolve. Uh, this one, this will be my last slide. Uh, I wanted to say that when we do puja, we uh, here is Saraswati puja, which is the the goddess of knowledge, and Saraswati puja we have we you know, uh, we offer sweets, we offer flour, we offer uh, some, uh, um, some kind of um, agarbatti or incense so that uh, maybe some sweets, some fruits, uh, milk, all kind of thing we offer. And believe it or not, it is all the thing that we like. We like milk, we like sweet, we like the incense, we like flour. So we like and we offer it. And I, we were talking earlier about the resonance, you know, how we become the same, how communion occurs. This is a process of communion. The idea here is that what Saraswati represents here, white sari, which means there is no blemish. It's all clean. The uh, niyamas, saucha, the, the first one, it's already there. It is represented here. And then, then you have uh, see sitting on a, on a lotus flower. Now, it is also a very big symbol. Lotus flower is the one of the flowers, one of the types of flowers that are always given example. It is It grows in the mud, very gross, comes through the water, but the water doesn't touch it. It becomes in part of air. And this is very interesting, the three phases of matter that we know, gas, liquid, and solid. It comes out of solid through the liquid and it's in the air, but then nothing touches it. So it's free. So it, it shows that, that we are, even though we have a gross body, we have a maya that kind of our mind runs around just like liquid. But it is, it is a freedom that is very important that you get beyond all that. None of that should touch you. Now, if you create, that is what Saraswati represents. So we, when offer our things, what we know, we like, then we expect that Saraswati will also offer what she has because we want to have a communion. So our knowledge comes from that process. 
Not that Saraswati becomes very happy because he gets some laddus. You know, that's just silly to me. The Saraswati doesn't need laddu to be happy to give you something. But this process is very scientific. This process is very yogic. Just like in yoga, we have we communion. We got, you know, we, when we do swadhyay, we, we get the whole thing. You know, we, when we have swadhyay, we understand ourselves. We, when we look at somebody else, we find that to be the case. So this is the concept of this resonance I have given here, the example of benzene. The benzene, the, there are two ways to write this benzene, and this is called resonance structure. So whatever is in first is also in the second, even though they look different. Same idea is there for human being to do the worshiping uh, in this way that I just told, that we offer, and we expect that whatever she has, she will offer. So we become the same. And that's the concept of worshiping in India. So with this, I would stop here. I have a few more, more slides, but it's not really needed. I, the point I wanted to make, I have already made. Thank you very much again for listening to me. I will be so happy to answer questions or concerns or, or listening to your comments also. I would be happy to learn something more uh, about these kind of things. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhutan. Thank you. This has been very comprehensive, you know, overview of yoga concepts, yoga philosophy. Excellent. I mean, we it's not more useful than what we thought we will have it with this by focusing only on chapter two of uh, 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 Patanjali Yoga Sutra. So thank you for that. So, any questions? Let me let me start with one simple question. You know, they say pranayama is a body mind relationship. You talked about pranayama. You know how uh, how it reaches to every cell and helps remove impurities you know, in cells, and also it based on thought process. So, any comment that what kind of relationship, body mind relationship, you see in pranayama? And, uh, oh, I mean, from science point of view, we know we know that uh, the the energy the energy is created with oxygen and that oxygen connects because of that oxygen that gets into the different parts of our body and different cells that we get oxygen uh, energy because of that now the, the but the, the way you do different you do different kind of prama you do bhastrika yeah. you do uh, all kind of you know you do anulom bilom for example yeah. so these are all practices that lets they let you uh, feel that you are you're getting it because I mean, asana is so obvious, but in pranayam, in the air, when you're breathing, you probably, uh, none of you probably have watched, let me, let me do just one minute exercise for you, all of you. Close your right nostril and breathe, breathe in through your left one. And then exhale from the right. And inhale from the right. And exhale from the left. I want to ask you, how many of you thought that your left nostril is easier to breathe in and breathe out? Can you raise your hand? I mean, that's okay. Or, or raise your hand on, on the, on the, by raising on the screen. Or you, those of you were up. How many of you thought uh, your right one was uh, more smooth than the left one? One. So three, four thought that it is left, three, one, uh, two thought that is the right. I tell you this, that I don't know whether you had this before, but if you wait for two hours, it will switch. It switches, <laughs> it switches back and forth, and this is a neuroscience. So your breathing, and actually there are exercises by which you can, by doing exercise, breathing exercise, you can switch them. And now it's interesting thing is that when your left nostril is more active, your right brain is more active. When your left right nostril is more active, your left brain is more active because your body is crossed, the left and right brain. So you were asking this question, <laughs> what affects? So you, it, it, this simple one thing, it is, it is something that you can observe and it has an effect and you can change it. I have seen somebody teaching, you know, how you can, do um, kapal bhati type of thing and then you will be able to change exchange this and this has a it's a, it has some uh, di medical diagnosis function also to find out how is your health if you are doing something like that so 
there are there are aspects of that um, dr despande that can be used by doing this um uh, breathing exercises or or pranayam any questions please uh, you know i have a question about uh, the chakras where we are saying lam ram vam sham so i like to sing and um, i like music so when you're singing sa re ga ma pa da ni sa sa ga ma da ni sa am i doing the same thing is this basically or is it different i think it there is a sound associated i am not that familiar with this the whole idea but i know there is a sound associated with each chakra not very sure whether sa re ga ma pa da ni sa is uh, in this series but that lam sam hum you know that kind of sound is yeah, there the sound, so that yeah. sound does have an effect on it i am not very familiar as to how that works okay thank you yeah bhushan ji ji namaskar yeah namaste first of all balram ji bahut bahut badhiya bahut acha laga so uh, just wanted to share in this whole context of uh, the shpande ji's question and this comment about the music see uh, i mean again this is a comment uh, it is so beautifully intertwined that you know you talked about uh, chakras and nadis so ida pingala sushumna are our three big nadis and ida is the saraswati is the cooling pingala is the parvati you know so is is surya nadi so chandra nadi surya nadi so saraswati uh, <laughs> parvati and then lakshmi is the sushumna the middle one and that's the balance so the beauty of all of this is everything is inter- intertwined unfortunately we when we give too much importance to intellect we forget the experience so just want to bring this back to i'm so happy that you started with experience and this is a experiential science agama as you said so again i'm just grateful to you as well as uh, you know so that's why when we do puja I, it's no different than uh, you know again it just comes back to the basics and when we go back to the basics life becomes so beautifully blissful just want to make that comment again and say say uh, thank you dhanyawad namaste thank you thank you very much the only thing i will say in say in that is just like you know we take example of a tree and there are so many aspects of a tree when we talk about we talk can talk about leaves we can talk about branches we can talk about roots stems and you know fruits so they it's the same way the example the symbolic thing that you are talking about lakshmi parvati and saraswati they are various they are sim, they are like eternal symbols and they fit in many places because they have those characteristics and many times in the world people get very upset or those who have like i said you know the nigam shastris they they think that you are worshiping uh, some deity some stone and this and that and and unfortunately sometimes we also do that we think that you know we are just worshiping and we are going to get no this is a concept the very is very very important that that have that concept and have experience so the saraswati parvati and lakshmi uh, they have they are representing certain thing just like i i saw benjin ring you know if i made a hexagon and bought some lines and said somebody though this is benjin they will be laughing at me but we really have that to understand this thing, the same the conceptually to have a conceptual thing which is like we are human being we we only understand in our language our language is that language of some kind of symbol we have i mean you are looking at this symbol my hands here you know this is all symbol you know i'm gesturing so because it makes sense as it it has a, it has a better if i just said like whatever i wanted to say and, but had my hand just to my body it will not have the same sense as i when i'm you know animated about it so then you you get that idea because this is all part of our evolution that we have evolved so those th- things are very very important what you are saying they can they fit on the ila pingla and ida pingla and, and susumna but they also fit in many other places the saraswati just like i told you the knowledge comes from those assumptions that you know the sari that you you have to have the uh, clear clean uh, mind clean body clean thoughts and then only we will get knowledge that if you, it's so obvious you know and the yoga helps you to do that so you know it's all connected in that sense any more hello please come up with your question yeah i am dr machwe from boston only my friend balram singh ji has given very good discourse it is 
Kula science of yoga. I should say not only yoga, science of yoga. Now here we have an assembly of very intelligent people. One thing I want to just ask or propose that can this yoga be assimilated with that hypothetical thing that we call Atma? How the role of Atma or is there any solid concept about Atma to correct these yoga things? Please. Yeah, Atma is a, it's a very important concept uh, that you are talking about, Dr. Matwe. Um, I'm going to very quickly, because there not, it seems like not too many questions. Uh, you are all very kind to me. Uh, let me just put one slide, which I did not get to, obviously. Uh, and then you will see that, you know, there's one science. Hopefully, I'll get to that and it will not take that. Long. So you can just see how many slides. Oh, there it is. Here is a, a science created by yoga, from yogic science. I, I talked about science, which is like uh, objective science. Here is a subjective but detached niskam bhav science. And where you see the, the world order has been created. This is true for not only human body. It is for entire universe the same way. So here you have panchabhutas. Then you have these trigunas. Everything has trigunas. And then you have mind, everything has mind. You know, I just said chitta vritti, I defined as a mind. So chitta means, chitta means consciousness and everything has consciousness, Sir J.C. both so did. And then here is the Atma. So the concept of Atma and Paramatma, sometimes people, you know, when they confuse with soul, they get, uh, they, they're not clear about it. But Atma is this, every, all of us have Atma and all of together, all of us together have is what is become, become part of Paramatma. Uh, the, that thing is so easy. People think that I don't know what is Atma. Well, do you know what is your mind? You do know that what is your mind. You do know your mind is going from here to there. When I'm talking about this, when I talked about Panjabhuta or Man or this and that, you, you, you know, say we, we all have our own ideas wherever we live. We think, oh, this is what it is. Well, that means you, you, you can monitor your mind, where your mind is going. You can get to your childhood, you can get to your school, you can get to your teacher, you get to your parents. Your mind can go. So who is the one who is telling you that your mind is going here and there? That's your Atma. So it is, I, I recently, I, I'm teaching a course, I, students were stunned because they thought that Atma is something we cannot know. Atma is self, that's you. That's why it's called Atma, Atmi, Atmaj. That's related to Atma. And this is existing in us. And you can see it because you can monitor your mind. Your mind monitors your body and sent through senses. So anyway, mm -hmm. that's, that's my, my sense because this is something, Thank that, you. Is something that is testable. Uh, you can do research on it. Thank you. See, we missed it. Hello. Any more questions? No, 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 I think then, hello. Govind Modi is there. He usually has some questions. Govind? No. Hey, oh, you, you talked about Atma and Paramatma. How about individual energy and universal energy? That is your, uh, your own consciousness taking it to universal consciousness. How do we how do we how do we relate that uh, this idea from that, science that, and and the issue of pranidhan is basically taking your own energy into universal uh, energy universal issue of pranidhan can be without puja pura with it just for surrendering the whole uh, no it doesn't have to have any of those rituals or even all the all the uh, all the um, themes we talked about just surrender to God can be rituals. so what I'm trying to relate is. You said Atma at the self level, Atma at the universal level. Can we relate it to the consciousness, concept of consciousness, the whole, whole idea? Yeah, of course. Uh, the, the, according to Sankh philosophy, consciousness is like you have um, Panch Gyanendriya, Panch Karmendriya, Panch Tarmatra, Man, Buddhi, Chitta. Chitta is consciousness. Then is Chitra is and then it is the what you you know as a mahat, which means you know that's the next to the Brahma, where mahat is where atma 
can be considered as a as a point of junction so in from that perspective when you look at that yeah everything has consciousness but we are our, our existence is beyond consciousness where where consciousness means i am still aware of myself i am aware of you but when you go beyond consciousness actually some experiments have been done very interesting experiment has been done where people had bought in you know, it was published in 2006 where people had to buy cars when they had only up to four features color engine size seat color whatever you want to call it four features they they thought about all this thing very uh, rationally when it made 12 features of the car it became subconscious you know they just made gut feeling like okay i want to buy this so they they publish it was published in science so what i am saying is that consciousness is not the ultimate consciousness is a gateway to the ultimate and where the atma is beyond consciousness so when when we become the same we are not there is the world, we, i and you exist when you say surrender to god means it's not like we are uh, disappearing our identity our identity of the way we want to look at thing the way we want we we like we un- understand that is gone you know because not we are not in in this trading mode at all that's the concept so when you get to the state of uh, ishwara you become obviously become say because there is no distinction now you also had asked about energy the energy the energy that we talk right now in physics most fundamental energy is heat energy because every other energy converts into heat energy but what is the concept of yoga is this pranic energy the pranic energy is perhaps subtler than heat energy and in most likely is the origin of the big bang and i visited shankaracharya puri because he is he is given many lectures on pranic energy i visited him he was very kind to me and i had conversation with him it's on the on the youtube also and then there actually he told and it took two days to to get this out of him uh, because it, nobody was asking a question like what i was very curious about and he said that the pranic energy comes from atma atma is the source of the pranic energy so that in the, when you are talking about energy can be be of course when we are at the level of atma the energy is uh, energy disappears at that point in atma everything is gets engrossed in doctor sir i have given this to this word atmorja atmorja you are talking just about it and shankara sir also told this word can be popular is atmorja atmorja yeah yeah good idea good idea thank you thank you i will try to use that and give you ramesh yeah ramesh uh, yeah i i don't want to hurt anybody's sentiment here because there are so many very literate and well read people here but then the question comes to my mind and i was hesitant to kind of say this but the question that comes to my mind is even the uh, chakras the chakras whatever seven nine uh there is no scientific proof for that the pujas we do that we offer flower milk butter laddu whatever it is there is no scientific this is all man created things even when we say god i think god is there is a, definitely an energy and natural spirit or something whatever you, which created universe or human race or whatever the animal kingdom but then god is created by human beings again okay so so all these things like i mean there there is i mean we go back we go back to vedanta we go back to all hindu uh, mythological granthas or everything but but then we read and we just uh, if 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 i am a scientist and if i want to prove for everything uh, it becomes very dif- difficult to accept some of those concepts and it is okay you know like uh, to accept those concepts and go along that way okay but but then there is always a dilemma in mind what to accept and what to not accept and some people say that they have reached that stage where they could get out of their uh, you know body uh, and then come back to the body and uh, so again uh, i just would like dr balaram to comment on some of these things that believing into 
philosophical or mythological or Hinduism versus the uh, uh, scientific proof. Uh, these, these are two parallel paths. And I don't think there is any situation where the humans will be able to relate those two paths and make it one path or whatever it is. Madam Singhji, please. Uh, only one point I would like to make here clear that those chakras, you have talked about it. All those chakras, he is, he is saying that is, there is no practical proof or practically anybody has experienced. The basic concept of that is Brahmacharya Palan. One who cannot pal, means, uh, uh, this Brahmacharya ka pal nahi karega, it is impossible for anybody. And show me anybody who has followed this Brahmacharya. All our rishis were following Brahmacharya and they were, they were in a position to go from one stage to the higher stage. I, I didn't say that. I was talking about the scientific proof. Yeah. Okay. I think that, I, yeah. So, so I, I think it, it's a very, very important, Dr. Modi, that's uh, the, the, like I told earlier, that you have to put a framework. We put a framework, and based on that framework, we try to uh, understand. So, the, like you said, that uh, it is very difficult for, pe for people to accept that you we get out of our body, you know, out of body experience. But you see this every day, every night, actually. When you when you are in dream, you are walking around all over, and you remember that you were walking around all over. And uh, I'm not saying that you have to believe in dream, but then you you do get out of your body. You have experience. You everybody, each one of us have that. Now we do not want to. I, I understand what you are saying is that those people who say that you know they're going to see something and and come back and tell, told us, I haven't seen either. But I tell you one thing, once I was in 11th grade and my, and I was, I, you know, I was in a district town for, uh, I used to stay there for a whole month and come once a week, once a month home. Once I had cerebral malaria, because in India, malaria is very common. I was by myself and I was really, really very sick. And uh, there was nobody around because all the boys had gone home. Next day, my uncle saw them. And he said that my mother sent to him, <laughs> sent him to me, saying that my son is not feeling well. I have no idea how did she know. So there are certain things that you have a gut feeling. You know, there's uh, in in even, even in science, we have something called epiphany. You know, you see the same data all the time, but someday, someday that makes it starts making sense. So that's one thing. The second thing is none of us have seen electron either. None of us have seen electron. We've only seen impact of electron. So as long as there is an impact, that's what we call a science. We, nobody has really an, any clue. You do not have a really a good sense that you are putting your foot forward and it's not going to uh, fall. But we have the faith that because we have done it enough that it, it happens like that. So while I think your question is very valid, but I'm not um, convinced that it cannot be looked at scientifically. There are a lot of things that were otherwise not open to science. I mean, you, 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 when, when I came to Ditra, either we met on some uh, evaluation panel discussion or something, or you know, some conferences, um, the botulinum toxin that I work with, it is a, we all know the botulinum toxin, there is a gene and the toxin and the toxin is the one which has the enzyme activity and that's the one who causes the blockage of neurotransmitter release. But we did not know that now we know, uh, this, even my lab has done some work, that botulinum toxin when it's surrounded by other proteins behaves differently than when it is pure isolated toxin. Now, what effects? Previously, I had written grant proposal, then people laughed at me. Why are you studying other proteins which are not important for this? The real toxin is the toxin. Now, we find that a real toxin is surrounded by other proteins, behaves differently. They have done psychological research when, and actually genetic research also, that if, if depending on who you are sitting with, who is surrounding you, it has an impact on your gene expression. So this whole universe, as you know, in physics, we have the concept of system and surrounding. System is something that we study. Everything else is surrounding. And we don't know what is affecting us. You know, I know in a spectroscopy, I do circular dichroism spectroscopy, where the proteins 
uh, asymmetry is defined by the by the groups not related to protein at all. So there are so many other things there. I mean, I'm not saying that we have the answer to your question. No, we don't. But I wouldn't say that we would not have the answer to question because there were certain things in my life which I thought that will never come out to be true, but it came out to be true later on. There were certain things which I thought absolutely true and then came out to be not true. Now, that is the beauty of science. I think I agree with you, though, that people just believe in certain things and they want to continue to believe, but that's not the tradition of India. I, I find that is not a reason of India. Like I said, I went to Sankaracharya. I didn't tell you the whole story. First day, he kicked me out because somebody introduced me that this guy is a great scientist and da, da, da. I mean, he, he could, could, couldn't give a hoot about that. You know, he's a Sankaracharya. But then I was very polite to him. I didn't say anything. Then he called, his office called me 10 o'clock in the night saying that he wants to talk to me. The same guy who thought that, you know, this guy thinks about it coming from America and he's a scientist. But what, what really, the guy told me what really influenced the, the Sankaracharya is my politeness. I did not say anything. I was very humble. And I told him that, you know, I'm here to come here to learn something. And he was so impacted. So what I'm saying is this, this world is very... Uh, twisty and turvy, you know. So I wouldn't say exactly that uh, science will never uh, have the meaning. I mean, in now in hospitals, they have doctors who are advising people spiritually, mentally. Mental stress is cause of 80% hospitalization and doctor visits. 80%. This is CDC data. So now the mental thing, how do you address the mental thing like this? Now, if somebody does believe for whatever reason, I, I, my, my way of looking at God is a little bit different than what normally people do. But the, if somebody does believe in, in that, that gives mental peace. Well, that's a science because it works. People have you know, been able to use all kinds of these ideas and then they are trying to develop theories. But there are uh, clear evidences of people remembering their previous life, clear evidence of people remembering publications have been there. How do they, how does that happen? We have no idea. So this theory of chakra system and this concept of punch sarira system is a model, whether this is a true or not true for everybody, I don't know, maybe, you know, be, but that doesn't mean that it cannot be a, a, act as a good model. Uh, Ramesh ji, I are, yeah. are, we, are we out of time? Because I don't want to yeah. get anything. No, but very quick, yeah, just quick. <laughs> Somebody else wanted to talk. Also. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'll, yeah, I'll let others talk. Thank you. No, you go ahead. Yeah, quick. Yeah. No, no. I, you know, I just, just want to say again, see, sometimes when we start talking about scientific data and as we, we forget the bigger picture here. And I'll, if, if I may just share this one word, when we say stotra, what we are doing is stuti. Stuti is praise. With, there is gratitude involved. So the point of all of this is that unconditional love that we need to develop towards so that gratitude with which we go into the void. And that's the so-called, you know, that uh, the nothingness that uh, Buddha talked about. Or, so that is the state. It's the avastha that we need to get to that goes through experience, not this analysis and uh, analysis, analysis that becomes paralysis. So again, my point is we all have to experience this simple, simple gratitude and, and uh, there's Joe Dispenza. If you don't know that name, please look it up. This is real, real science. The blood markers are being uh, studied right now with the effect of med meditation for a novice. So it's not about being an expert sitting in caves and in Himalayas. So my point is the science is there, data is there. We just don't know enough about it because we are not practicing enough. Enough that. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. No, I think either somebody is raising hand. No. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi. Namaste, Dr. Namaste, Pradhanji. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the question I had was, you know, there's a lot of discussion about conscious mind and subconscious mind. And, you know, what I have learned for myself is sometimes you sleep over something and you discuss the answer uh, to very complex problems. You know, some, you know, things become very clear. So it's not like, you know, s science has answers for everything, but the sub subconscious mind you know, is is something we should learn. Everybody should learn because it, you know, it gives a lot of clarity. So, in with the inner journey, also you know, ex external journey in in getting answers. So, science is about getting an answer, right? 
Yeah. So, so how do we master, uh, you know, learning through conscious mind and subconscious mind? So I'm, you know, I just, there's a lot of discussion on this. So through yoga. So my understanding is for anything, we have to do that. For, you know, in the, when we were little to, to be able to write, you know, A, B, C, D, it was a lot of effort. And only by doing, we were able to do it. So same way, even in science, I just talked to Dr. Modi. He knows I work with botulinum toxin. And by working only, I could come up with ideas. Uh, botulinum toxin is the most toxic substance in this world. It is 100 billion times more toxic than cyanide. It is 5 million times more toxic than uh, uh, snake poison. And actually, my lab was completely free of theft. Nobody ever stole anything from my lab because nobody will ever go there. People yeah. think that it will eat them. But yes. the same toxin, which otherwise people they still do not want to go near, it's a biothreat agent. But by studying it, by embracing this idea, now we have made good medicine out of it. It's called Botox. And there are further medicine, including my lab is interested in and yeah. developing some other ideas. So uh, it is like an abstract answer to your question. But my point that I wanted to make was that by doing only you will understand. That. So and, and yoga is a, um, in, to me, is very, very effective way. Like I said, I was the person who did not believe in yoga in 1999. And after that, when I did the yoga, I started teaching this course, Science of Kriya Yoga. I did not uh, go to tell in the detail. That's the only course that meets science requirement in the University of Massachusetts. It meets <laughs> science requirements, even though it's yoga class. There, there are six units, science units, students required to graduate. And this three credit course meets one of those uh, three uh, units requirement that um, university looked at it and they consider yoga the way we approach it as a science so there is a there is not a problem so i think it's just only question of pursuing it you know i pursued it even though i was very skeptical about it i practice yoga and i i find that huge difference in my uh, understanding of things my uh, understanding of myself and my um, my clarity of thoughts as I see about it. So I think it's the only question of doing it. I would I would recommend highly to do it and do it for at least three to six months before okay. you start making comment on it. Do it to three to six months regularly. Even if you do it for 15 minutes, it's good. Then you will start seeing yourself. You know, you don't need somebody else to tell you as to what the impact it has. Okay, thank you. Dr. Bhatia, you have any question? Yeah, I, I have a comment as a matter of fact. Uh, Balram Singh Ji, when I invited you to give a talk on our UOS, uh, I had a, <laughs> a different idea, but uh, what, whatever talk you gave was excellent, wonderful. What is going on is very much wonderful. But now I feel you need to come to UOS once again and give one more talk, because even though your talk was very wonderful, uh, you talked only about uh, Ashtanga Yoga and uh, the, the specific uh, details of Kriya Yoga, uh, yeah. you didn't mention anything about them. I mean, what are the Kriyas, how they happen, etc., etc. So there is a whole lot which uh, still remains to be talked about. I thought your talk is going to be on Kriya Yoga. <laughs> no, no, Dr. Vati, he covered Kriya Yoga is... No, 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 sir, no, sir, no, 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 no. <laughs> Rameji, please, please, please. You don't know what is Kriya Yoga, so please don't make no, it. No, I mean, no, I'm no. going by definition. No, 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 no there, are, there are specific things. No, there are Siddhis. Totally yeah, there are different Siddhis. ball game yeah, yeah. in Kriya Yoga. Yeah, that is another chapter. That is, yes, uh, yeah, right. that is, that is uh, Vibhuti Pada and then Kaivalya Pada has all Siddhis. So that no, is no. a that is a that is a under chapter. No, you are you are sticking only to Patanjali Yoga Sutras, but yeah. there is a whole lot apart from Patanjali Yoga Sutras that exists in Kriya Yoga. And I was under the impression that Balram Singh Ji will talk about that, <laughs> but yes. but that did not turn out to be so. I will be happy to uh, to cover whenever you whatever you want me to. I with based on my own understanding, of course. Um, but Kriya is, you know, just to give you a, a just a brief uh, answer to your question, so that you may not have to invite me again. <laughs> so why, uh, why not? Why not? 
no, no, I have no problem. No problem. Actually, you know, I I love to uh, uh, interact with a group like this. This is wonderful. But I I'm just going to uh, show you a slide that I was going to show you at the end of my uh, my presentation, and that talks about kriya yoga. Uh, kriya actually, you know, the kriya is very important to talk about in in terms of kriya yoga. And I'm going to share this. Um, that will give you at least some thoughts uh, for for future discussion. Oops, it's always sorry. So you get to see what I what I did not talk about. Um, I'll I'll get there. This is one slide I wanted to show show you. So here is everything is starts kriya. Kriya is something that happens. You don't do it. You only pay attention to it, and you learn from it. You, it, this is something that is continuously from Nasadiya Sukta Rig Veda. It says there was nothing at one time, and then it has the whatever that su supreme power you might can call the supreme energy or consciousness. Then it has the desire to breathe. It's called um, oscillation, spandan, started, and that's the kriya. That kriya is the one which develops into karma. Karma that is the destiny or goal. That creates all these other karma phala, drabya, psychology, politics, all these things that we are talking about today, science and everything else. Then, oops. Then that is the one when you do yajna of all that. You do yajna. It means you know, you finish them all. Finish them all doesn't mean that you really eliminate them. You give them up, like I said, pratyahar. You know, you just give everything yajna, and yajna means is the all the thing turns into gyan through the meditation process. Oops, I keep hitting, and then you get to the yoga. You are on top of the the whole universe. I mean, this is just talking about world, and that is what I think is what you are, and you are. I, I made it very gray. You are not visible. <laughs> Kriya is a visible. Karma is your goal. This all other things appear, and then only when they appear, only so that you can disappear them by understanding everything. Whether it's even suffering, is a Kriya. And then when you are able to yajna of all that, then you realize that oh, that's now what I am. So anyway. That's that. So I will talk about kriya from Patanjali Yoga Sutra if you want me to come back. But I, like I said, my my discussion is always going to be relevant to something, not just theoretical. Yes. What what that is? Yes, yes. So that that that's what I meant. That uh, this demands another lecture because uh, kriya yoga, as um, you know, Babaji and Lahiri Mahashay and all that, and Yogananda's uh, book on. Uh, Autobiography of a Yogi, etc. The Kriya Yoga that is implied in all that is still another ball game, which is still remaining. Actually, the Kriya, the, the Kriya exercise that I did with you is one of the exercise that was at least Paramhans Yogananda's activities. So yes. this, this was a, a very beginning for everybody that they used to do. So that is a Kriya. And then from there, we, I mean, I build it up by, you know, talking about in general, but mm -hmm. one could yes. be very specific about Kriya and talk about all the things that have been talked about Kriya by, by some of these very learned masters. Yes, I mean, my, my point is that many more lectures are called for. <laughs> all right. I mean, I got a quote. <laughs> thank you. I think, thank you, Dr. Balram Singh, from my side, but um, Rajani, our coordinator, she would like to give a vote of thanks. Rajani, are you there still? Yes, yeah, I'm here. So thank you very much for everybody to at attending this wonderful lecture given by Dr. Singh. And as everybody indicated, they want him to come back again. So we'll try to do that sometime soon, depending on his convenience and everybody's calendar. So with that, I'm going to say thank you to everybody and be on the lookout for our next session. And if you have any questions, concerns, please send them to Ramesh Deshpande on your UOS WhatsApp group, and he will be able to address those. 
with that, good group. night and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Thank you, everybody.